Tri-State Worship Center, our aim isn't to be the best church in the community, but to be the best church for the community. We're here to encourage the saints, help the hurting, and embrace all people. Tri-State Worship Center, there's a ministry for everyone. So if you're looking for a place to grow and serve others, or just need some additional encouragement, we've got you covered. Keep it casual and very friendly. You'll barely make it through the door without being greeted with a smile and a handshake, or even a hug. about a dress code. We don't have one. The important thing is that you come. So come in what you have and we'll go from there. It's our vision to be a beacon, a light, a celebration of hope, a hope that we can only find in Jesus. We only ask one thing. You've tried it your way Why not give his way a try? We'll see you at church. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Go herd. Sorry, sorry. Uh, welcome to Tri State Worship Center. My name is Pastor Terry. This is my lovely wife, Vicki. There was another Vicki with us this morning. Did you know, see that? I saw that? Hey, Vicki Black, how are you? Um, we're excited to have you join us this morning, whether you're here in the sanctuary, join us by Facebook. Excited to see what the Lord has in store. Amen? Amen. Good morning. Good morning, Facebook. Uh, if you're a first-time guest with us or viewer, if you were text the word welcome to uh, the number on your screen. And if you're a regular tender, text the word here to the same number so we will know you are here. That's a good thing to do. You should do it. We're not going to stop the service here in a little bit to receive the offering. We don't do it that way. We just ask you to put your tithe, your offering, your building fund commitments, your missions giving into the boxes that are on the wall located throughout the building. Uh, since we're talking about missions giving... Let me just also say that if you um, have a dollar bill or a five dollar bill or a ten dollar bill and the serial number begins with the letter J, we call those Jerusalem dollars. And we have a little white mailbox out in the foyer that we put those J dollars in and we send them to Jerusalem. Last month, just doing it that way, we sent eighty dollars. Now, that may not seem like a lot. But $80 is $80. And so um, if you have a, a serial number on a dollar bill that starts with J, we call it a Jerusalem dollar or a J dollar. Um, and, and since we're talking about the J dollar, we really started doing that because of Pastor James Lucas, which was Keith and Rod's dad, who passed away this week. And his uh, funeral service was Friday out of East Lynn. Now, I know a few of you are aware of where East Lynn is at. It's way out there. I mean, no, I mean way out there. And uh, at, at Brother Lucas's funeral, they raised $500 for Jerusalem because that was his heart and that was his, yeah, yeah. And so uh, 
Rod and Keith and Derek and Michael Aaron and all, all that family wanted me to pass along to you uh, their thanks for your support and your prayers uh, during the, the loss of, of Pastor Lucas. And it was a celebration time. It was really good. But if you have a J-dollar, stick it in the mailbox. Also, I, I'm getting there, honey. It's like we're sitting at that stoplight when it turns green. And you're like... He forgot last service, okay? Uh, <laughs> We're having a baptismal service on October the 2nd, October the 2nd. Anybody interested in being baptized, we ask you to attend about a 15-minute class on September the 28th, which is a Wednesday before. And it'll be in the adult class behind the coffee bar. We talk about why we do it and how we do it and uh, what, you'll, what you can expect when that happens. Baptism, October the 2nd, class, September the 28th. All right. We still need volunteers to help Irene Wentz uh, fitting the homeless on Saturdays. Contact us if... You were interested, or if you know anyone that's interested, they don't have to attend Tri-State Worship Center. If they just have a heart for reaching out to the homeless, uh, we can get them connected with Irene. Uh, also, um, Girls Night Out, Tuesday night, we're having tailgate foods and doing bookmarks. Um, so if you're not familiar with Girls Night Out, it's just a time for us to, all the women to get together in fellowship, because it's hard to do that a lot of times uh, in service, because so much is going on. So that is at 6 o'clock Tuesday night over in the Fellowship Hall. Also, um, Royal Rangers need canning jars. They are doing apple butter this year. So um, if you will bring those in, we'd appreciate it. And then Carol Harless is a member of a group called Sewing for Souls. Um, they are just in need of fabric, any flannel sheets, flannel fabric, batting, any type of a waterproof fabric. And they're making uh, different items to send to different countries that are in need. So you can bring them to church, and, and we'll make sure Carol gets them, which is what we've been doing, right? And she's been, they've made a lot of stuff. Let's stand. As you know, we put our prayer list up on the screen as well as on our Facebook pages so that you can continue to uh, remember these people in prayer. A lot of people have a lot of needs, but we serve a big God. How about special needs this morning? Let me just see a hand real quick. Amen. You, you believe God's able? Amen. I'm going to ask Landon Preston. Come up here and join us and, and any of the family that wants to come. Landon will be leaving, I think, this week, tomorrow maybe, to go uh, serve in the military. And so we want to have special prayer. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Landon once paid me the greatest, one of the greatest compliments I ever got in my life. He said, man, that guy's strong. <laughs> Um, we love you. And we, as a group, we want to say thank you, you know, for, for serving, but also to let you know that the Lord's going to be with you no matter where you go, no matter what you're just like he's with Connor, just like he's with Trevor and all the other military people that are serving. So we just want to pray over you this morning. If that's all right with you, I'm sure it is. Right. And, uh, so if you would, let's just pray for our prayer list and also let's pray for Landon this morning, uh, and, and invite the Lord into this service this morning. Lord, we just bow before you this morning. We thank you that you are such an awesome God. We think you're a God that in heaven that loves us and cares about us, a God that's uh, intensely involved in our lives. This morning, we just present to you Landon Preston. God, just put your hand on his life. Guide him, direct him, protect him. Thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you, Lord God, for uh, his willingness to go and protect our freedoms that we might be here this morning. I pray that you would just be with him. God, I pray for every name on our prayer list as well as those represented by an uplifted hand. God, that you would just move on their behalf and just let us hear reports of victory, how you've touched your people. God, I pray for those who are given the offering. Bless them. Multiply that offering for the upbuilding of your kingdom. God, today, let everything that we do point somebody to Jesus Christ. Keep your hand on land, and we thank you for that. Ask it in Christ's name. Everybody said amen. amen. Come on, let's bless him. We bless you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Greatly to be praised. Wow. Wow. Amen. Turn around and tell somebody you're glad to see him in church. After you do that, you can be seated for just a moment. Thank you, praise team, for leading us to the Lord, going with us there and bowing down to worship him in spirit and in truth. Someone say amen. amen. Let me just quickly remind you, if you're a first-time guest, to text the word welcome to that number, 740-244-8694. If you're a regular attender, text the word here. It just helps us keep track of you. Danny, you made it all the way back from South Bend? 
Where's the rest of the gang? I appreciate your faithfulness, brother. Go herd. <laughs> I told the first service, my youngest brother, his wife, Bianca, is, uh, I mean, killer Notre Dame fan. Killer Notre Dame. So she texted me before the game. All I got to say is, go Irish. That's what she said. I said, you do you. As the game progressed, we saw we were going to win. I fought the urge to text her. Matter of fact, my nephew, my youngest brother's oldest son, texted my son and said, I'll Venmo you $5 right now if you will send Bianca Marshall's fight song. And then I said, I'll add another five if you do it. But he wouldn't do it because we're all afraid of her. Um, <laughs> Now, this is the part Josh doesn't know is about two hours after the game, I texted my brother, Eddie. I said, too soon, question mark. <laughs> he texted me back. He said, Bianca has already changed her clothes, and I'm pretty sure she's not going to be Catholic anymore. <laughs> so, so, so see, Marshall is used by the Lord. Can I get amen? Amen. 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 This is the third installment in a series of sermons. We're talking about some of the hardest things that we will do. Some of the hardest advancements spiritually that we will ever try to do in our lives. The first week we explored the difficulty of taming the tongue, taming the tongue. The reason it's so difficult is because it starts in the heart. Out of the mouth speaks the abundance of the heart. So really what needs to change is the heart because as the change in the heart happens, then the change in our tongue happens. We cannot do it with just willpower. We, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to help us to do that. Then the second week, we looked at replacing worry with trust. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean into your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge Him. He'll direct your path. You cannot trust in the Lord and worry. You cannot say, I trust God, but I'm worrying about. It, it's, it's one or the other, not both. And so if you missed either one of those that are on our YouTube channel, I would encourage you to go take a listen to that. Earlier this week... Uh, our worship leader, Linda Brown, sent me a link to a video that I think fits perfect for this message this morning. I was in Alaska doing a lawsuit. We're way out in the Aleutian Islands, getting ready to leave and go back to Anchorage and then home. And I had a ticket in my pocket to get on an airplane. A pastor came up and he said, listen, I can save you money. I said, how's that? He said, I flew a small airplane up here. And I fly a small airplane and I can take you in my little airplane and you can save your ticket. And this did not sound, I said, gee, thank you so very, very much. But I've got this ticket. We'll just make our way on home, me and this other lawyer with me. He said, no, 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 you got to do it. You got to do it. And against every better judgment I had, I said, okay. Well, we went out to the airport, took us by his little plane and I looked at it and I thought, Well, one good thing, it's shiny. Then he walked around it. We got in. He's on the left front. I'm on the right front. The other lawyer's sitting right behind me. And he started it up. And it started up just fine. Well, we taxied out. I said, should we pray? He said, yeah, that's a good idea. We normally don't. I said, well, this time we're going (laughs) to. And I'm telling you, I prayed five, eight minutes. I prayed a long time. We went and got on the runway. He starts down the runway. The plane lifted off ever so gently and we start climbing and it's wonderful. Not a problem in the world. We started climbing and we flew probably three, four minutes and something happened that will never leave my mind. The pilot turned to me and he said, we're going in the clouds and I can't fly in clouds. They make me pass out. I said, clouds make you do what? Now, it's been cloudy all day. And we go right up into the clouds, and you can't see anything. And he looks at me, and his eyes roll back in his head. And he starts mumbling, and he passes out. Passed out cold. Now, I grabbed him, and I shook him, and I said, come on, you got to wake up so I can kill you. Now, we're in the clouds, flying along with no pilot. And my friend in the back seat said, we're dead, aren't we? I said, there's a very good chance of that, yes. He said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. But there was a radio right there, and I handed him the microphone, and I said, start asking for help. So he's in the back seat reaching up, and he said, hello, hello. 
We didn't know any proper radio etiquette. All we were saying was hello. And somebody answered back, hello, hello. Don't you guys know proper radio etiquette? And I said, give it to me. I said, tell them we don't know nothing. Tell them we're in an airplane with a passed out pilot and we don't know how to fly this plane. The guy said, I'm a freighter flying out of Anchorage on the way to Tokyo. And he said, you're telling me you have nobody who can fly that plane with you? I said, tell them that's correct. Now you gotta understand, I am sweating bullets. He said, the first thing I'm gonna do is start circling so I don't lose you because I'll fly out of range of your radio and you won't have me anymore. And he said, I'm gonna get Anchorage emergency for you. And Anchorage Emergency will be the people that can maybe help you try to save your life. After about five minutes, Anchorage came on, said, we understand you have a passed out pilot. And those of you do not know how to fly that plane. We said, that's right. They said, well, the first thing we got to do is find you. And I'll never forget what this man at Anchorage said. He said, my job is to get you home safe. He said, that's my job. But he said, here's the deal. If you want me to get you home safe, you got to promise me you'll obey my voice. He said, you can't see me, but I can see you. And he said, if you're not going to obey my voice, you're going to die. When you can't see anything, you have no idea how disorientated you become. Finally, he said, okay, I found you. Now hear me clear. He said, you're four minutes from a mountain. He said, you're going to crash in that mountain and die. Follow my voice. I never said, I have to follow your voice. Is that reasonable? You see, I understood without his voice, I had nothing. And do you understand? Without God's voice, you have nothing. Nothing. Finally, he got us turned. And he said, I'm freezing all the traffic in the area. He said, it's going to take me an hour and a half to get you to Anchorage. And there's a lot of weather between you and Anchorage. You're in for a rough ride. And he said, I want you to hear me. I don't want you to look at what's going on outside. I don't want you to pay attention to the storm, just my voice. He said, if you start watching the storm, you will die, but I'll take you through it. Now, because they cleared all the traffic, several pilots, those nighttime freighters, those 747s started talking to us. They said, we're praying for you, men. You're gonna make it. But listen to the voice. That's the key. They said, trust the voice. Do you realize your head is full of voices? And everybody in this world wants to talk to you. And everybody wants to be the controlling voice. And God says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to put yourself on the altar and let my voice be your voice. Finally, we went through the worst of the weather, but there was still more. And then the voice came back and it said, now, I'm going to line you up. He said, I'm going to bring you in right down the runway. And at the foot of the runway are some lights and they're in the form of a cross. He said, don't you forget this. The cross is the way home. Finally, he's bringing us down. We still can't see anything. And all he kept saying is, stay with me. My sheep, the Bible says, hear my voice and they follow me. Finally, just a couple hundred feet off the ground, we saw the cross. I landed the plane. In fact, I landed it seven times. <laughs> Finally, it all came to a stop, and the minute we stopped, the pilot woke up. The voice said, thanks for listening. I watch them crash and burn all the time because they won't follow my voice. They don't understand I'm the one who can see them even when they can't see me but they get the voices in their head and they kill themselves. They self-destruct. Thanks for listening to the voice. Then they put us in a motel room at about four in the morning, the knock at my door. And I opened the door and a man was standing there. He said, hello, David. I said, you're the voice. You're the one who got me home. He said, I am. Do you understand one day you're going to stand before him and say, you were the voice. You're the voice that brought me home. If you're not on that altar as a living sacrifice, your head's full of voices. And then we wonder why kids crash and burn. We wonder why marriages are shattered. And the Lord's saying, I'm the one who 
has the voice. All I can remember is that voice saying, stay with me. Amen. Stay with me. Don't listen to what's going on in your head and don't watch the storm. Stay with me. And I'll take you through. Tonight you have a God who has promised to take you through. A living sacrifice, holy. Amen. And here's why I felt like it was important for us to, to see that and to hear that story is because it'll matter which voice you listen to this morning, whether you hear what the Lord wants you to say, what, what the Lord wants you to hear or not. I, I don't know if you're ready to hear what God really wants to say to you this morning. As a matter of fact, I know that some people won't hear the voice because they've already decided what they want him to say. Instead of listening to him, they've just decided, well, this is what he's going to say. Some other people won't listen because they've already decided it doesn't matter what he says. I'm going to do what I do. So I need you to understand this morning that we need to make sure we're listening to the right voice. And this morning as I was preparing to, to leave our little apartment to come here, and I was getting dressed, and I'm not trying to be over-emotional about it. I'm not trying to use hyperbole, although I've been looking for a reason to use that word for a long time. I'm telling you, when I got dressed, I felt like I was dressing for war. Because I'm convinced that the enemy does not want you to hear what the Lord wants you to hear this morning. So I pray that you will open your ears and hear because today I want us to understand the importance of confession without excuse. Confession without excuse. Lord, we need you now. Not another minute, not another hour. But right now, we just need you to give us a teachable spirit. Let us hear your voice. Help us to be real and honest with ourselves. Help us to resist the voice of excuses. And help us to understand what it is that you have for us today. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for that. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Someone say amen. amen. Billy Sunday was a pioneer preacher he used this definition of excuses. He says an excuse has been defined as the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. It's the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. A farmer went to his neighbor and asked if he might borrow a rope, and the neighbor said, sorry, I'm using the rope to tie up my milk. He said, you can't tie milk with a rope. He said, I know, but when a man doesn't want to do something, one reason is as good as another. And I'm afraid, I'm concerned that you and I live in a world of excuses. We, we have excuses for everything. We have excuses for why we're late to work. We have excuses for why we don't have our homework. We have excuses for why we don't want to obey our parents. We have excuses for why we don't want to go to church. We have excuses for why we don't want to support the church. We even have excuses for why we sin. And if we confess with excuse, it's not confession. Not at all. If, if you said, Lord, I'm sorry I did this, but as soon as you said, but, he, I don't think he hears the rest of it. So King David, he gave us a really, really good example. And I, I hope I can get through at least half of what I got prepared. I, I didn't get through a third of it in the first service. So I pray that the Lord will really speak to us. Because what King David does and all the things that he did wrong, and we, we, we'll go through that in a minute. You know what most of it is. King David, when, he came, when it came time for confession, when it came time to repent, he didn't make any excuses. He, he owned his sin. And rather than make excuses, he just offered himself to the mercy of God. If you have a Bible, I want you to turn to Psalm 51. We're going to read the entire chapter. It's 19 verses long. And it goes like this. Have mercy upon me, O God, David speaking, 
according to your love and kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. That Hebrew word there is rebellion. Blot out my rebellion. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, my depravity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, my rebellions against individuals. And my sin is always before me. Listen to this next line because this is the entire message this morning. Against you and you alone have I sinned. Against you, God, and you alone have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Verse 5, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make, make me to know wisdom. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop, a, a plant that they used in the Old Testament for medical reasons. Purge me with that, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all of my iniquities. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors. I'll tell other people about your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Not because I went there and said I confessed, but but that I confessed to you and you cleansed me and I became a mouthpiece of your forgiveness. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, and the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. His tongue would be able to do that because his heart had been changed. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not despise, or I'm sorry, you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would have given it. You do not delight in burnt offering. Listen, listen. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness and with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. You will not get out of me the name of the congressman, but recently a congressman was brought before the ethics committee for something that he had done that was a charge that was going to be brought against him. And the congressman came up with what I call a three-way defense against the charges that were brought against him. First, he said this, I didn't do it. Then he said, well, I did it, but I did it unintentionally. And then he said, anything that I did was the same thing that other lawmakers have done, but without penalty. In in other words, I did it, but I have an excuse. Now, I know you would love to know the name of that congressman, but the truth is, it's all of them. And the struggle is, it's some of us. See, there's a lot of different mechanisms that we use when we try to shift the blame onto other people. I did it wrong, yes, but it wasn't because I wanted to do it wrong. It was somebody else's fault. We call it blame shifting, trying to escape that responsibility. We call it deflecting. We call it projection. We call it denial. If I just deny it, it'll go away. We call it minimization. I did it, but it's really not that big of a deal. It really didn't hurt anybody. Passivity. I'm sure everything's going to work itself out. Defeatism. Well, I did it, but it's too late now. It's the toothpaste is out of the tube. And the truth is, too often you and I confess, but that confession is no good when we attach an excuse to it. It's not valid. 
As a matter of fact, D.L. Moody, another pioneer preacher, said that excuses are the cradle that Satan rocks men off to sleep in. So I want to impress upon you the idea that real confession does not include excuses. It's time for us to set them aside, confess to the Lord, and repent without excuse. Acts chapter 3, verse 19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. How do we get our sins wiped out? We repent. What is repenting? Well, it's the act of leaving what God had prohibited and returning to what he had commanded. We have to repent when we've gone somewhere that God has prohibited us to go. We, we've got to turn away from that and return to what God commanded us to do. The word denotes the act of being repentant for our misdeeds. How is it possible for you and I to have atonement, at one with God? How is it that we can be restored into right relationship with God if we just give excuses all the time? How can we be restored without confessing, but yet the confessing needs to be without excuses? So I want to compare two confessions this morning to kind of help give us an idea of what we need to do. The first confession is the confession of King Saul, the first king of Israel. We, we probably know his story, but in case you don't, he became the first king of Israel. Israel had a lot of enemies. One of those enemies were the Amalekites. At one particular time, God told Saul to go kill the Amalekites, wipe them out. Destroy everything. Don't bring anything back. Saul goes with his warriors. They defeat the Amalekites. When they come back, Samson asks, did you do what God asked you to do? Saul said, well, of course I did. And with a weird twist of humor in the Old Testament, Samuel looks at Saul and says, well, then what is the sound of the sheep and the cattle that I hear? If you did what God told you to do, why, why am I hearing some noise that I'm not supposed to be hearing? And here is where I want us to understand Saul's confession. It's found in 1 Samuel 15, verse 24. Saul answered Samuel, and here's what he said. I have sinned. I have transgressed the Lord's command and your words, prophet, because I was afraid of the people, I obeyed them. You see, the first two sentences of his confession are great. If he could have just stopped there, it would have been great. But he goes on to blame shift. He goes on to try to deflect. I sinned, but it was because... I was afraid of the people. That last sentence. Project. It's not my fault. I did it wrong, but it's not my fault. It's my mom and dad. It's because I don't make the money that everybody else makes. It's for all the reasons that we can come up with and all the excuses that we can come up with, but that confession is no good. Now let's look at the second confession. King David, the second king of Israel. We know his story. He's anointed king. It's about 14 years before he finally ascends to the throne. He's been running from Saul all that time because Saul wants to kill him. He finally gets to the throne. He's in charge. His army is at battle. And instead of him being where he should have been at battle, he stayed at home on the castle roof. Saw Bathsheba, had her brought to the castle. She's pregnant. He brings Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, home from the battle, gets him drunk, hoping that he'll go home and sleep with his wife. And again, he'll be able to deflect the shame of a pregnancy to someone else. It's not his fault. The problem is Uriah was a better man than David was. Uriah stayed at the castle to protect his king. So David has him sent to the front line, knowing that he'd be killed. Do you understand this is some pretty heavy stuff? So Nathan, the prophet now, 
is aware of David's sin. He's aware of David's action. He goes to David, and we find his conversation in 2 Samuel chapter 12. I'm going to read it to you. It's the first 12 verses. It says, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, This is Nathan the prophet talking to the king David, and he's going to share with him a story. Now, here's the story. There were two men in one city, one rich and the other one poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate out of his own, his own food and drank from his own cup and lay his head on his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. Verse 4 says, Then a traveler came. Came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare for the wayfaring man who had come to him, but instead took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Look at me. Don't read the rest of it. Look at me. You understand where we're at? David's done all these things wrong. God sends Nathan the prophet to David to tell him this story basically of himself. So what was David's response? David was angry. His anger, it says, was greatly aroused. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this should surely die. And he shall restore fourfold the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Look at me again. Understand something, that in the Old Testament days, the king could do that and you're dead. I mean, Nathan is in a life and death situation. Tells David the story. David responds by saying, that guy, whoever did that, needs to be killed. And the person who lost the lamb needs to be restored fourfold. And Nathan looks at King David and says, you are that man. Now, I don't know about you, but can you imagine what David must have felt? What he must have felt when Nathan looks at him and says, you're that man, you're him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. You're the rich man. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you Saul's house and Saul's wives into your keeping. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And then God says, if that really wasn't enough, if that was not enough to keep you from looking at Bathsheba, All you had to do was ask me. Look what he says. I gave the house of Israel and Judah, and if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. If that wasn't enough, David, I would have given you more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You've taken his wife to be your wife. You've killed him with the sword and the people of Ammon. Verse 10, now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and you have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. If you know the story of David, you know that that's exactly what happened. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. He shall lie with your wives in sight of this son. For you did it secretly but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. Now, it's very crucial for you to understand where David's at at this point. David knows he's that man. David knows he's the one that did it. David's the king. David could snap his finger, people die. But listen to David's confession as he responds to Nathan in verse 13. David says, I have sinned against the Lord, period. Not because, not if, not but. He said, I have sinned against the Lord. And because David confessed without excuse, 
We read in the last part of that verse, Nathan replied to David, the Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. We have too many believers that have confessed with excuse that continue to carry the sin. The sin that separates us from God. David's confession, I have sinned against the Lord. It's not anybody else's fault. It's my fault. It's not my mommy. It's not my daddy. It's not because of this. It's not because of that. Confession is agreeing with God that you have sinned, period. But confession plus excuses does not total confession, as a matter of fact, it's not confession at all when we tie excuses to it. Now, there's a lot of different things that I could share with you, but let's just go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, we know that God created Adam and Eve, put them in the garden, said you can do anything you want, just don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We know that they disobeyed God. Everybody with me say, uh-huh. God goes to them and confronts them. Listen to what their responses were. God says, have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Adam said, the woman that you gave me. She gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's bad enough he blamed the woman. But then he blames God. I sinned. I disobeyed. I was wrong, but it wasn't my fault. It was that woman you gave me. It's her fault and your fault, but it's not my fault. And God looks at Eve and asks her, and she said, it was the serpent. He's the one that deceived me and I ate. Listen. Flip Wilson was wrong. The devil can't make you do it. Those of you that know what I'm talking about, I know how old you are now. And those of you who are like, who's Flip Wilson? He was a comedian, and his, one of his big punchlines was, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. The devil can't make you do anything, but she blamed the devil. She said, the devil, it was the serpent. He deceived me. And what that, what that is is confession with excuse. We know what happened with Adam and Eve. They were cast out of the garden. Cursed and cast out of the garden. You have these different types of excuses that we come up with. And the simple fact is that when I don't accept what I've done, if I don't own what I've done in, in disobeying the Lord and missing the mark and not doing what he commanded me to do, instead going to where he prohib prohibited me to be, when I don't accept that, it's not true confession, and I don't think that those sins are forgiven. We can try to rationalize it, minimize it, project it, deny it. We can do all those things. But the only way we get repentance is by confessing without excuse. And if confession is agreeing with God, you and I must agree with God, period. It's not everybody else's fault. One of the biggest struggles in, in, in global Christianity is this victim mentality that seems to have invaded the church and the community of faith. That I do these things, but it's not my fault. It's because I was raised poor, or was, I was raised by heathen parents, or, or the school that I went to, or the job that I'm on, or... I mean, it's just excuse after excuse after excuse. We got to agree with God, period. Because if we don't, listen, if we don't, forgiveness cannot take place. And if forgiveness doesn't take place, then the guilt remains. And here's, here's, here's a hard one. If forgiveness doesn't take place, and the guilt remains, listen, the sin continues. I know I'm talking to, 
I'm talking to myself, but I'm talking to a lot of people this morning in the sanctuary and on Facebook that there seems to be that sin that just haunts you. You ask God to forgive you, but you've confessed with an excuse. And the next thing you know, that sin is right back at your doorstep. You can't seem to get away from it. But the reason is is because you have not agreed with God, period. You've agreed with God, but you've got a reason why. You've got an excuse why. And we're really good at that. We'll even make somebody else look bad so we can look better. Well, yeah, I sin, but I'm not as bad as she is. I, I didn't mean, I'm just using you as an example. Although, I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. just kidding. Yeah, I did it. But what I did wasn't as bad as. Yeah, I did it. But I deserve it. I, I work hard for my boss. And so, yeah, I clocked out early. Nope. Man calls it an accident. God calls it an abomination. We, we call it a defect in us. God calls it a disease. We call it an error. God calls it enmity against him. We call it liberty. God calls it lawlessness. We call it trifle. He calls it tragedy. We call it a mistake. He calls it madness. We call it a weakness. I just have a weakness. God calls it willfulness. So here's the model. Go back to Psalm 51. Number one, admit the severity of your sin. I I don't know. Maybe one of the reasons why we make excuses is that we don't want to believe that we could have done that. Or we don't want to believe that what we did was really that bad. We, We have to admit the severity of our sin. Secondly, we need to believe that God can forgive us. And he will forgive us. And the third thing we need to do is commit to God willingly. 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 Sin in our life is a problem. Listen to me. If you don't hear anything else, please hear this. Sin in our life is a problem. It's not something to be ignored. It's something to be dealt with. It's not something to be excused. It's not something to be pushed off on someone else. It's something that we've got to deal with, and we've got to do, deal with it by truly repenting of the sin. And here's what I mean. Linda, if you'll come, I'm, I'm going to try to land this plane. I went full circle. Did you see that? Full c- A couple of weeks ago, I said, repenting is I was walking this way. And, and I know that's wrong, so I'm going to turn around, and I'm now going to walk that way. I don't know if you remember that. And, and, and frankly, that's true. But I left out an element. I left out an element that's so crucial. And that element is this. What is the posture of my heart when I repent? Because if the posture of my heart is not broken... Remember, the Lord doesn't want sacrifices. He wants what? Broken spirit, contrite heart. If the posture of my heart is not in the right place, then that repentance is probably not going to work. I'm just going through the mechanics of it. Let me jump to a scripture. Jonas, I'm going to jump down to Joel 2.13. Here's what the Lord said to Israel. Now look, you and I are part of Israel. You can say, well, he wrote that to them. We're, we're adopted into the family. We're part of it. So this applies to us. Look what he says through the prophet Joel. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. In the Old Testament times, when people were expressing and experiencing great grief, they would rip their clothes. You can read it all throughout the Old Testament. They would tear their garments and set in ashes or tear their garments and go for three days uh, without food or water. And God says, that's cool and all, but that's not really what I want. 
He said, I don't want you to rip your garments. I want you to rend your heart. The posture of your heart in repentance is crucial. Because if we don't change the heart, we're not really repenting. And if we don't change the heart, we're not going to tame the tongue. And if we don't change the heart, we're going to worry and not trust. Do you see how crucial this is for us to be able to know the posture of our heart? In those times of repentance, when we confess, we've read that David's psalm is of repentance. And he reminds us that God does not delight so much in the outward signs, in the sacrifices, as he does rending the heart. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. So we, we can be in the habit of going through the motions. But if we don't do it according to scripture and according to God's command, it's, it's not going to work. You say, well, pastor, how, how do I get a broken heart? When it comes to repentance, when it comes to confessing sin without excuses, we get a broken heart by simply asking, God, break my heart. Matter of fact, David said it this way, created me a clean heart, O oh God. We just got to ask for it. We cannot neglect our relationship with him. We simply go to him and say, Lord, let my heart be sensitive to what it is where I've missed the mark, where I've rebelled. That's why David said, against you and you alone, Lord, have I sinned. That's why he said it that way. We've got to behold the glory of the Lord. And the more we do that, the more real our sin becomes. The more intense our sin becomes. And so, if we've listened to the voice this morning, I hope that what you've heard is the Lord saying, rend your heart. Repent. Confess. If we confess, he's faithful and just to forgive us. But too many of us walk around haunted by past sin. And I'm, I'm afraid that in those instances, it's probably because we confessed with an excuse. And, and so I'm going to challenge us this morning in a really strong way. What, what is that sin that haunts you? Whether you're here in the sanctuary watching us by Facebook what is the sin that haunts you? Have you confessed it without excuse? Have you torn your heart? Stand with me. Uh, up here on the altar, Carol will probably get upset with me because I didn't give this to her. But there's some, <laughs> there's some just strips of cloth. And I, what, I, what I want us to do is, is purely symbolic. There's no power in the cloth. There's no spiritual content in the cloth. It's just a symbol. And what I want the cloth to represent is our heart. I want the cloth to represent our heart. And here's what I need us to do. This is going to be bold. I want people that just identify with what I'm saying identify with there's that sin that haunts me that I can't seem to get away from and it could possibly be because I haven't rend my heart it could possibly be because I don't have a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart over that and if that's you this morning right now I'm not going to count to three I'm not going to snap my fingers right now I want you to come and get a piece of cloth just stay here in the altar with me and we're going to rend our hearts together now listen, don't wait on somebody else to move. If, if the Lord is dealing with you, you should move right now. Come get a piece of cloth. Just stand here in the altar with me. And I'll give you some instructions in just a moment. I appreciate you guys responding. Look at me for just a moment. I want to remind you that there's, there's nothing about this piece of cloth. There's not, it's just symbolic. 
But I really believe that, it, that if we go through this motion, I, I'm, I'm looking at it spiritually. I'm looking at it as hearing the voice of God, not the enemy. And I'm, I'm looking at it, like I've said, that this is warfare. This is war. I'm not trying to say this is easy. It's not. But here, here is our heart that's continually haunted by the sin that, that seems to just so easily beset us. And here's what I want us to do. I'm going to pray for us, and at the end of that prayer, I want you just to rip this thing in half. And after you rip it in half, I want you to take it with you. I want you to put it somewhere where you can see it. I want you to put it in your car, put it at home in the bathroom, put it somewhere that will remind you that you're not bound to that anymore, that you've been set free because you have confessed without excuse and you have a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Lord, right now, In Jesus' name, Spirit of the living God, just break our hearts. Break our hearts for the haunting sin that seems to beset us. Bring to remembrance those things, Lord God, that maybe we try to confess with excuse. And help us, Lord God, to come in agreement with you, period. Help us to come in agreement with you that we have sinned against you and you alone, God. Not because of anything, not because of anyone, but simply because we rebelled and we disobeyed and we sinned. And now we come to you and we confess we have sinned. And Lord, we want to come to you and confess that sin because we know you're faithful and just to forgive us and then cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let this simple piece of cloth represent our hearts this morning. As we rend our hearts and not our garments, we rend our hearts for you. God, I thank you for that. I ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Would you take that piece of cloth and best you can just rip it in half? After you rip it, just hang on to it. <laughs> Do it. Rip it three times if you need to. That's all right. Now I want us all to bow our heads for just a moment. Lord, thank you again for this, this time together. Help us this morning. Keep your heads bowed. If you're here this morning, you're not in a right relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to give him your heart so that he can break your heart. You need to give it to him. All the things that have been wrong, all the ways that you've missed the mark, he wants to forgive you of those things. But the first thing you got to do is give your heart to him. You need to confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Christ is Lord, that God raised him from the dead. You can be saved. So if you're here, you're not in a right relationship with Christ, but you want to be, I would love to pray with you, but that decision is yours. That decision is yours. So I'm going to ask the praise team, if they'll sing this chorus through just a couple of times, those of you that are in the altar, stay here with me. And if you're here and you want to uh, have a prayer and ask the Lord to forgive you and accept him as the Lord of your life and be saved. As we sing, would you come? Would you do that right now? I'd love to pray with you. you you thank you if you if you're watching my facebook thank you for being with us i pray that you took a piece of cloth and ripped it there in your living room or wherever you're watching us but listen to me as soon as we dismiss you're going to be challenged what which voice you're going to listen to if you're going to continue to listen to the enemy that's probably not going to end well listen to the voice that can get us home 
listen to the voice that can land us where we need to be. And when we do that, when we do that, I'm telling you, that's a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. So listen to the right voice when you leave, okay? Promise me you do that. Right now, say, I promise. Okay, don't break your promise to me. I love you. Don't forget men's meeting tonight at 6 o'clock. God bless you. We'll see you the next time.